Hi everyone, welcome back. Our next speaker has an interesting topic to talk about. This is Robin Pokorny, and uh, give him a warm welcome. Hi, hi, welcome, welcome everybody. I'm uh, so happy to be here. Uh, my name is Robin, as was said. I work at Klarna, and Klarna, that's a fintech startup. When I first heard fintech, I thought it's like Finnish tech, but it's actually financial tech. But Klarna is from Sweden, so, well, yeah. Anyway, it's a, it's a bank, and uh, we, we run across multiple countries, which means there are certain things that are important, well, not important, paramount for us, and that is robustness and maintainability. So today, I want to show you a path how you can think about maintainability and robustness and bake it into your code with this, with this simple approach. I will be also showing some code, by the way, so wish me luck. Let's start with... A very simple response to a request. You have a validation. You, have, you receive something, you validate it, you then go to the database, you write something to the database, and then, then you lock what you've written there, what was returned, and then you return, right? That's, that's easy, simple. Not. This code is a liar code. It lies to you. It's bad, very bad. Why? Because it only shows you what you want to see. It only shows you part of the truth. What happens? if validation does, fails? What happens if the database is not available? What happens if the logging is, is not available? Anything else? Like, you only looked at the happy path of your code. And that, that's understandable because happy paths make you happy. But that's not the truth. As a programmers, we know there will be other things. Like, we do the validation because it can fail. So that's a problem. And I will be talking about how to solve that and how to make it visible but also maintainable and robust. And the solution is simple. It is functional programming. Don't leave. <laughs> I know you want to leave. When I say this, the audience splits into two groups. The first group are people you know, who heard about functional programming, and they heard about monoids and endofactors on monoids, and, and they are like, oh, that's academical. I don't understand a word of that. Uh, and to those people, I, I welcome you here very much because I will not be using this. Like, this is the only slide you will see anything like this. I believe that the concept behind functional programming can be explained without these words in a much easier manner and maybe more visual manner. And uh, you can still benefit from them. The second part of the audience would also like to leave, but it's because they already know functional programming. They fall in love with it. And they probably use you know, their airlines, Haskell, closures, uh, whatever. And, and they, they know how to use that. They know the types and know how, how useful that is. And they are like, what am I doing this talk because this guy is going to explain the basics? And to you, I have to say, I will be talking about TypeScript. And while these languages are cool, TypeScript is what's being used. Uh, it's what we came to love to use. At least we have to use. It's there. It's omnipresent. It's the ultimate full stack language you can use on mobile apps, you can use it on, on obviously on web, you can use it on, on web services, everywhere for scripting. That's the one language you can use. And my question was, you know what? These people are having fun. Let's take these structures they love and use and use them in TypeScript, which we kind of have to use. So in the next 30 minutes, I have three tasks for you. I would like to, no, 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 no. I have three tasks for me to show you to do. Uh, the first one is to show things. And uh, this approach is very visual, and I believe that's how, you can, how things can click for you. Because functional programming has this chicken and egg problem. Like, once you understand it, you lose the ability to explain it. Uh, and I believe that you know, being exposed to things from different angles can help you do that click and be on that part that, which can't explain it anymore. But you can benefit from it. I will be using uh, TypeScript, and I will show why I need TypeScript. And of course, as I said, I, I would like to write some code. Uh, my daily job is a domain architect, so this is an opportunity to write some code. That was a joke. I, I do still write some code, but still, I'd like, I like to show it. What I present is not entirely new. Uh, I'm adapting proven things from outside. So this is Scott Lushin. He's been talking, uh, podcasting, video taking, whatever, about what he calls railway-oriented programming. However, he talks in, about this in, in F-sharp. He shows people coming to F-sharp how they can 
uh, adapt these things. What I took is the learnings and some ideas, and now I want to show you how to do that in TypeScript. This is an application, any application. I, there's an actual code there, but I hid it because you would read it, and uh, I don't want that right now. But you can imagine any code. For simplicity, let's think of a code that goes you know, from top to bottom, and you kind of mutate data. And it doesn't matter if you do it in like an object-oriented style where you mutate the objects in there, or you return new instances as we do in uh, functional programming. But it kind of goes from top to bottom. And that forms this kind of line. I will call it a, a rail. And on this rail, you will have your mutations. You change things. Like things happen somewhere, and uh, you change things. I will call this functions. Very simply put, this function as an input and an output. It's, uh, if we imagine these uh, train tracks, you have a train coming with apples going to this factory on the train and then leaving with bananas. Somehow it happens. The beauty of this idea is you can combine things. And when you have one track which has two factories on it, one transforming apples to bananas and one bananas to strawberries, this is virtually indistinguishable from having one factory which just transforms apples to strawberries. This is, you know, composition 101. And we will take a big advantage of that, of this mental model. OK, how does that, like, what does it mean, right? We just talked about a few things. This is the code I showed you at the beginning. And as I said, this is a liar code. And you would be thinking, yeah, sure, I would handle these things. I wouldn't write it like that. I would write something like maybe this, which, uh, you know, has a, some try and catch. And, and I mean, if there's an error, you, you do something. Like, you handle these errors. So this code is, is complete. It's, it's fine. It's not because it completely hides and hinders what the code does. The, the important bits which are there, like, together, and they, and you, they show you what's happening, are kind of hidden somewhere in between and there, uh, and, you, and you don't know w what is important and what is not. There is too much noise in this code. So what we want is kind of this combination, to have a good overview of what's happening, which will help us with the maintainability, but also handling all the errors, which helps us with uh, robustness and reliability. Oh, yeah, and uh, with, with throw and returning early, it's kind of like an explosion on the tracks. You know, like the train stops, it just flies into the space, which is web, but you, you, you have no idea what happened. And if you, for example, want to eventually react to that, you don't know if, if somebody else didn't return the response earlier and maybe it's already lost. You cannot transform it, you cannot recover from it, because you might have a default, but, uh, well, it's already returned to the user, so no defaults can be used. Our approach is have a line, a track, uh, and then let's add another track. We will have two tracks. And this is, this, is the, this is the main idea. This is the thing. By the way, guys, if you want, I, I still see some free spots here. So if you want to move there, uh, you, can, you can go in two tracks or one. Yeah, one. Uh, anyway, this is important. What we do, instead of blowing these errors and, and failures, we just move them to another track. Two tracks next to each other. One for when things go right, and one for things when go wrong. I want you to have this image. It's like really like the trains, nothing more. And you just pass it. The benefit is the errors just don't explode. You still have them on the track, just on the second track. So. You have a function, it is an input. It has a success path we talked about, but now it also has this failure path, which goes, uh, which goes to a second track. It's very similar to blowing things, but you don't blow them, you just put them on another track. Um, however, that's kind of not how programming works, right? Uh, you, don't, you can't have two inputs and two outputs, kind of. So uh, let's look at it, uh, and let's maybe look at some code, I believe. Anyway, 
We have two tracks, and I put them horizontal because it's easier, but it's the same thing you had in your code before. You had success and failure. And now we go for the, for the fun part. Uh, so what I have here is uh, running Visual Studio Code, which just shows me TypeScript. And uh, the best thing is that I can hover over things, and it will tell me what is the computed type there. So I want to talk briefly about the unions. Uh, union means that you have a choice type. That uh, property is either string or a number. This works. If I would, for whatever reason, put something that's like an object, you get an error, which tells you you can't use that. Uh, we can go a little bit further, and we can type is also like literals. So it has to be string, hey, or string, ahoy. Uh, and, and it works. When you try anything else, you get an error. This is very useful, for example, for uh, response error codes. So you know that your application will return, I don't know, 200, 400, 500, but it will not return 418, I'm a teapot. Uh, so it's much better than just having a, a numbers. Thank you for laughing, by the way. We can go a little bit one step further. Here we have a function which gets one argument called a, uh, and that is an object containing name, a string, or id, which is a number. And you see when I try to access the name immediately, it says, wait, 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 maybe, maybe it's the other, other part you got. So we don't know the name exists there. However, if I first check for it, well, yeah, it's there, so I can use it, but it also does a, interesting thing that uh, when there's a second parameter, it knows that here I have to be in the first part of the, of the object, like the first uh, shape of the object. So I also have age even though I checked for name. Very useful. We can take advantage of that. Uh, so this is called unions, uh, choice type sometimes. And then we can do something which we call tagged unions. We define a type and we will have this specific property, which will be a literal string in there, and then anything else. So when we get a function, which receives either a person or a robot, we know that when the tag is literally person, there is name, but there is no ID. And if we would uh, write a, a robot here, we, we get a, the, the opposite, of course. And I think that this now gives you a idea of what we're actually going to be doing. So as you remember, we had two tracks, success and failure. And then that's, that's exactly what we will do. We define a type of success will be object, which will have this tag success. And the value is, is Steve. This is like a type property. Imagine strings if you don't know what that means. Uh, or the second thing is a failure with a tag, literally failure. And the value is the error message there. And the result, which is what I call this, uh, is, is either success of type T or failure of type E. Uh, let's use that in the code we saw before. So as you remember, we had the validation database and logging. And this is maybe how the validation looks like. You get an input, which is an unknown, and you want to check that it's an integer. So uh, this is the alt definition we had before, because now you throw when the uh, input is not a number. So let's use this. Let me maybe uh, put a little bit less space here. Uh, let's use this uh, success and failure so this works. So what we do here is that we kind of keep this check, but we say if it's not that, we will not return an error, but we will return an object which will have, and I will just copy it from here, because I'm a little bit lazy. Uh, and then let me format that a bit. Duh, duh, duh. This is to be a comma, of course. Uh, now, uh, it's complaining because I said it's returning number, which is not true anymore. But this is what you do. Like, I literally return an object with this shape. Uh, of course, if things go right, I will, well, let me, let me write that so it's more easier. I will return the other shape, which is success. And again, I'm uh, copying things. Uh, here, the value stays as it was. The only difference is that now it's kind of inside this object. When I hover over validate, something will happen. 
it sh knows it's either that object or this object. What it doesn't know right now is that we named these before, so we need to tell it. And we can use this uh, combined, so I will say that the result is either number or this string. And now everything's fine. When I hover over validate, I see it receives an input and it returns a result, which is either a number, if things go right, or an error message. And we will see why it's important that I didn't put string here, but uh, the, the actual type. Uh, when doing this in the wild, you don't have to uh, copy these things. There are ways how the TypeScript can interfere, but uh, I want to keep it easy to show you. We, we, we didn't use any library, we didn't use anything, just use plain TypeScript right now. Uh, I did a very similar thing for the uh, database update. Just quickly look into that. You receive a number, uh, you do something in the database. If it's success, you return again this object, which returns, for example, the date. Uh, you, you want that. Or it returns another uh, error message. And the result here is uh, either date or uh, error message. With logging, that's easy. With logging, you don't do anything, actually, right? You just receive a value and you log it. Like, it doesn't have a return value, so there's nothing to transfer it into because there's no result of, of logging. Uh, maybe there is, but let's say for now we don't have that. So uh, we have these three functions. We combine them, and now we go back to slides. Do I need TypeScript? I think that my, many of you might be thinking, you ain't going to need it, right? We could write this in JavaScript, like the functions you've wrote, sure, but all of that works in JavaScript uh, or anything else. And yes, you are right. But imagine what I just wrote without the types. Like, you would be lost very fast. And it would be very tricky to see if you actually returned what you are supposed to return, if the function returns, and all of these things. So in a way, the TypeScript gives you so many things that uh, help you that I believe you kind of can do that in JavaScript. That's why maybe people didn't do that. Uh, and you, you need these, this help. And I think there are three things that TypeScript really helps you with. The first one is the self-documenting code. As I said, it's much better to say I'm returning a failure than just returning an object or something else. It's, it, it's there. You can hover over things. You don't have to scroll. It's much easier. You see things. The, the IDE will help you understand things. Then there's exhaustive uh, uh, failure checking. We will get to that a little bit later, but it means it knows what is happening. And if you, uh, as I said, for example, return what you should be returning, or if you uh, go through all conditions. And also, composing can be tricky. So we just transform these pieces together. Oh, sorry, we just uh, transform them one by one, but we haven't put them together. And that's where things get tricky uh, with the types, because they kind of need to fit. And it's very easy to forget something or to do it a little bit wrong. And if you don't have this automatic check, it will, it can, it can bite you. Uh, like, and you can spend so much time trying to debug that. Uh, we will show many of these things uh, in the code. But then there was this lie I told you before: is that we just transform function that got one input and one output, maybe throwing something, to one input and to output. But then this is not how it works, right? Uh, we kind of want these functions to have two inputs and two outputs. And, and no language, I take that bet, JavaScript does not support multiple uh, return, uh, return values. You can have one input, which could be you know, arguments, it's an array, and one output. Uh, as we saw, we kind of circumvent this by wrapping things into an object. But now we need to solve uh, this problem of having this, 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 this thing. What is that? Like also input, but kind of yes, kind of not. We need to care, take care of that. I believe that we will be doing some code. Oh, not yet. Uh, so what we need, again, we wrote function that takes one input and returns the result to something that accepts result and returns result. And we will do that by, by basically bypassing or like merging the failure tracks there. And it's, it's, it's one of the magics that will, you know, when, when once put together, it's, it's, it's awesome. So let's uh, look at the code. We need to, I don't want to pick you there, uh, write a function. 
uh, write a function, as I said, that receives, like, this, is, this is how it's going to work, right? We have the update DB. We will call this function that receives it as this F. Then it receives the result, and it does something that should return result and combine things. That way we can transform this function from, as you see, input uh, to result to result to result, which, will, uh, which we have to write. But it's actually very easy. And the, um, OK, I was told that I shouldn't be saying easy, so it's like straightforward, let's say. Uh, it takes some time when you like, need to wrap your head about it. But once you do, I think it, it makes a, a lot of sense. You just look at the result tag. And if that is uh, failure, uh, let's, say, let's say success. And uh, oh, I don't have it typed. Uh, this is, you see, this is like I would have to now I have to remember how to write success, which I hope is like this. Uh, if you if it is successful, it's on the right track. You basically just run function on the result dot value. I see that now. Uh, if not, you just take what was there and you return it, which which we know was the the failure one. But it kind of completely bypasses the function f, right? Very simple. The problem with this is that, again, we don't have uh, types. And typing this is a little bit tricky. I did it here. That's why I didn't want to show you. And we can quickly walk through that. You see that it, it like these two functions are completely the same. Oh, actually, I, I switched it, but you know, it's, it's the same. Uh, it's the same if there. But we added some um, types. We, when we look at, okay, let, let, let's look at the result. Again, we take a function that takes input, returns result, and the result and the, uh, the combination takes result and returns result. And you see one thing, which is like the beauty I was talking about. And that beauty lies like here. What this says is that it will eat, like the, the failure will either be the new thing or whatever ever came to the, uh, came to the, uh, failure track. So you kind of combine these things and you can uh, kind of append to the new error types and you know what is happening. If we did only string, we would have no uh, view into that. I don't want to go into much detail about this typing. Uh, it, it just takes some time to kind of get it right. You do it once, it works. A uh, second function we kind of want for this is called t. Uh, so chaining was uh, converting a function that takes one input to, and two outputs to uh, two and two. T uh, takes a function that doesn't do anything, meaning it only logs, and it kind of splits it. So if it's, uh, if it's successful, you run it. If not, uh, oh, sorry, you, you don't return it. You, you only run it as a, as a side effect. And that's it. Back to slides. So now we have it together. And again, some of you might be thinking, isn't that promises? Like, we kind of have that promises that can be fulfilled, rejected. We have these two tracks. Couldn't we just use that because it's built in? No, like, absolutely not. And this is, this is important. Several reasons. Uh, first thing, promises have a very, very small API surface. Like, there is, uh, we will look at it. Uh, there is one method. It's called then. And then sure, you have catch and you have uh, finally, but these are just syntactic sugar for them. And then you also have some combinators, but these are even, like, even fewer. Like, yeah, sure, we have four of them. Some of them are more useful than the others, but it's it. Like, it and it gets pretty tricky to write anything after that. I recently wrote a library, which is promise for the law when I have a, a concurrency only running several promises at once. And it's, it's kind of annoying to do that. It's not that easy to work with that. So promises are not a solution. And there's one more and much more bigger reason, and that is uh, domain versus panic. And I'm talking here about errors. Now, we have two types of errors, domain errors and uh, panics. A domain error is something that happens in your business logic. It's something that you expect. It's this validation is not correct, or maybe there's a corruption of the data, like this user can't do that. Uh, or external system is unreachable. Like you plugged in your system, you know it can fail, you have to handle that. Panics are things that you cannot handle, and uh, it's like an out of memory exception or division by zero. It's like a programmer errors or infrastructure errors or whatever. You cannot do anything with that. But both of these things happen in your system, and 
with no exhaustive checks, you cannot distinguish these with, with promises. So with promises, you only have successes. You can type what is a success. But once it goes uh, to the failure track, to the rejection, it can be anything. You don't know what is there. You always have to have everything there is. And it's, and it's not even possible to type it anymore because of this, like people were overlooking big problems. Um, so putting it to all together, I wrote this action as a result of what we've written, like all these functions we defined it before. And here I'm using a function called pipe. Oh, no, no, don't look at that. Uh, a pipe is just a fancy way to say call uh, A and with the result of that call B and you know, kind of passes the data from one function to another. And the beauty of this whole thing is that when I hover over response, I know that the result is either a date, which is the, from the update DB function, or one of those two errors from these things. It kind of combines it. Like I know it, I see it, I go there and I see it. Uh, and then I can, when I want to handle the failure, I have these exhaustive checks, which means I handle these two error states. And then I want to handle this one. And the TypeScript tells me, well, this is not needed. Like we, you haven't used it, nobody, nobody can even throw this. You don't have to handle this. And this is cool because maybe my colleague removed some functionality. And now I can, I can, make, uh, I can streamline the error handling. But without it, I, would, I wouldn't know about it. I wouldn't know if it's still possible or not. This, this makes it very clear, and it fails at computation, uh, sorry, compilation time. It also knows that I reached all of the possibilities there. So not only I, I'm adding more, but all were done. So I'm there. And if I misspell something, now this code is, this is uh, reachable. So this is what I think is super cool. And what we use it for is translations for errors. Imagine you have a form, you have an email, you have a, I don't know, phone and all of that. And then you have an error, uh, length is longer than 50 characters. You don't know if you, if you need that. Maybe somebody changed the limit for uh, email to 50 and then somebody else changed it to 100. If you have these exact error messages, and maybe that's a wrong example, like you can parameterize it, but it could be something else, like this field can't be empty or something like that. We know that if you include this field in your form, these are the possible errors. Meaning, from the whole form, these are all the possible errors we can get, and we need translations in all 50 languages we have. And this all can be checked in runtime. That's like awesome. Uh, I have a few things I want to show you. So, how, it, uh, how TypeScript helps me. Imagine that we made a mistake, and here, all the up way here, in this update, we are expecting a string, which for this function is fine, like there's no errors here. The error becomes when you try to combine them again together. And again, we will see an error message, a little bit cryptic, I agree, but there's an error message. And in the end, it says number is not assignable to string. It takes some time to see where you might have made the mistake, but it, but it uh, holds you there. Let me, let me quickly fix that. And the other problem we can, we will, we can catch very easily is this forgot chain. That's a, that's a fun one. So, you know, you, you get excited about the pipes, and then at one point, you just put update DB. So you took a function which has one input, two outputs, uh, but you want it to be two inputs, two outputs. And again, TypeScript will hold you. It will <laughs> write a message which, again, takes some time to, it doesn't tell you exactly what it is, but it, it catches that. And in the end, it says success number is not assignable to, to number. You need to a little bit dig into it, but it, it, it catches that. That's what I was talking about, like why you need TypeScript, is this combination can get a little bit uh, tricky later on. Uh, if you would like to see this code, I already published this as a gist. Uh, if you don't remember that, I will tweet that. Uh, so uh, you can take a picture of it, well, maybe later. Uh, now, uh, you don't have to write these things from scratch for yourself, these result types I talked about. Uh, there are libraries that handle that. This is my favorite, it's called FPTS by Giulio Canti. He's a mathematician, a mathematician in Milan. He wrote uh, it very nicely, it's, it's you know, very pure uh, FP. The only difference is that he calls uh, it left and right, and the, the idea is right is right. So kind of my success is his right. And the, thing together is, is called either, which is like the other way how people call this, this type. Uh, the problem is that it's, he's a mathematician and the documentation is, whew, yeah, uh, 
and not great. But that happens. We have that. We can make it better. That's something we can solve. You know, I have a library and the documentation isn't great. Like, how many times have I heard that, right? We, we can fix that. I had to include this. This is from this morning. I was on Twitter and I saw this, this, uh, this video and I was like, I don't, I don't know like, what this is about. It's kind of fun. But, you know, again, two tracks. Uh, I had to include it. It also shows you that this presentation is very fresh. It's like literally this morning. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have anything about it. I just found it funny. Uh, to conclude, Scott Blushin is uh, trying to democratize the functional programming. I believe we can learn a lot from that. He wrote this book. Uh, it's a pretty cool book. It talks about F sharp, but we can easily transform it with the TypeScript. Uh, I, will, I will share all that uh, together. I would like to end with this final thought. Final thought. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. And that is a quote from Greg Sattel, who wrote a book about innovation. And I really like that. He says, innovation is combination. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to take this language, which exists, which is there, omnipresent, and these ideas that work for other people, and saying, hey, what, have you met each other? Could we do that? Maybe, maybe we'll learn something new. And uh, I know it's going to be difficult at the beginning. Another quote. You have to master a new skill, but you're avoiding it because you know you'll be bad at it when you first do it. And that's, that's what I was like, you know, you started the FPTS, the documentation is bad, you don't understand these concepts, but slowly, you know, you spend an hour, you play the, with it and it clicks and then, and then it's awesome. So uh, with that, with this rather or the programming, you can do one thing, you can chant. You can say T for TypeScript, T for train, robust code, I will maintain. <laughs>